Hello and welcome to this latest Science Custom Podcast, created in partnership with Bold, the blog on learning and development. I'm Sean Sanders, Director and Senior Editor for Custom Publishing at Science, and I'm delighted to present this series of podcast interviews with outstanding researchers who are attempting to make positive changes in the lives of children and adolescents by seeking practical solutions for a complex world. Apart from this common goal, they are also all recipients of the prestigious Klaus J. Jacobs Research Prize, a 1 million Swiss francs grant awarded by the Jacobs Foundation that recognizes exceptional achievements in the field of child and youth development. I'm very pleased to be talking today with Dr. Sarah Jane Blakemore, Professor of Psychology at the University of Cambridge in the UK and leader of the Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience Group. Her group's research focuses on the development of social cognition and decision-making in the human adolescent brain, as well as adolescent mental health. Sarah Jane, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about your research. Thank you for inviting me. So Sarah Jane, with two teenagers in my house, I'm really excited to maybe get some insight from you about how their minds work. I think most of us understand that adolescence is a time of huge changes in the brain, but what is actually happening during this critical period and what influence do external factors like stress and social environment have on this developmental process? Yeah, so until about... 20 years ago, we didn't really know that adolescence is a period of great developmental change. It was assumed by neuroscientists that the brain stops developing in childhood. That's what I was taught 25 years ago during my undergraduate degree. And it's really only in the last 20 years that very large scale studies using MRI scanning have shown that in fact, the human brain continues to develop right throughout childhood, but also throughout adolescence and even into the 20s, both in terms of its structure and its function. So really substantial changes are happening in the brain and also behavior across human adolescence. So can you say a little bit more about the biological changes that are going on? I've heard the term synaptic pruning. What does that mean? I mean, there are huge numbers of biological changes going on in the brain across childhood and adolescence. We know from MRI scans that both The structure and function of the brain are changing. The structure is changing in terms of how much gray matter the brain contains and also how much white matter it contains. Generally across the cortex, which is the surface of the brain, white matter is increasing and gray matter is decreasing during the period of adolescence. And by the way, we're defining adolescence here as the period of life between 10 and 24 years. So quite a wide age range. And in addition, you asked about synaptic pruning. We know that synapses, that is the connections between brain cells, become reorganized across development. In early development, synaptogenesis generates new synapses. In fact, generates a very excess number of new synapses in the brain. And those excess synapses are then eliminated, or at least some of them are, by a process called synaptic pruning. And that's a really interesting neurodevelopmental process because it partly depends on the environment that the animal or the child is growing up in, in that synapses that are being used in a particular environment are the ones that remain and grow stronger. And synapses that are not being used are the synapses that are eliminated, that are pruned away. This process of synaptic pruning occurs in certain brain regions like the prefrontal cortex right throughout adolescence and even into the 20s and 30s. So how can your research inform how we raise our adolescent children and uh, also the way that society sees and treats them? I think what this research does is it highlights the fact that adolescence is a really important time of transition and a time of change. Adolescence is characterized by really very substantial changes in the brain and gradual changes in the brain and also in all sorts of behaviors like decision making and planning and inhibiting inappropriate responses, also social behaviors, social cognition, peer influence, mentalizing, the ability to understand other people's minds and self-awareness. So what I think this does is it gives us an insight into perhaps why some adolescents behave the way they do and the kinds of changes that they're going through. And I have found with my own 
children and also the children that I work with and the young people I work with, but also with teachers I talk to and parents I talk to, and even teenagers themselves largely appreciate understanding the biological basis of the changes they're going through. It gives you a kind of insight into why sometimes things can be difficult. A time of adolescence can be a time of turbulence and a time of anxiety sometimes for for some young people. Understanding the biological basis, I think, helps you have a better kind of empathetic understanding of that. You've brought adolescents into your research through enabling them to become citizen scientists in your projects. How has this worked and what have you learned? Right from the very start of working on adolescent development, in my lab, we have always thought that it's so important to include young people, not just as participants in our experiments, but actually in every part of the experimental process. So right from the very beginning, you know, designing experimental questions, thinking about the questions we might want to ask, and then also involving them in the design of the studies and the protocol and the stimuli. And then even in the interpretation of, of the data, they're the crucial people really in terms of what we're, what we're trying to understand and what we're studying. So not to include them would not make any sense. We wouldn't, you know, culture changes so much and to have an understanding of what matters to adolescents, you really need to speak to adolescents directly and not make guesses based on what you think's going on. Now, Sarah Jane, we're recording this interview in July 2020. And uh, we're right in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you think the social isolation created by the pandemic is going to impact adolescents in in the short and long term? This is something that's really interested me. And right from the beginning of the pandemic in Europe, when it was clear that countries were going to have to go into lockdown, my colleagues and I became really interested in the effects of lockdown and social distancing on adolescent mental health. And that is partly because we know that peers and and face-to-face peer interaction becomes really crucial in the adolescent years. That's what we've been working on in my lab for the last, I don't know, 15 or 18 years, the importance of the social environment for adolescent development. So we became really interested and slightly worried about the consequences of social distancing and social deprivation on adolescent development and adolescent mental health. It just so happened that I have been working with Livia Tomova, who is a postdoctoral researcher at MIT, but she will be joining my group in October. And for the last year, we've been planning to conduct a study on social isolation in adolescents. We had already been in discussion about social isolation and done a lot of reading around social isolation in adolescents when COVID happened. And this prompted us to write a review in this area, which we did, it was published about a month ago, on what we know about the effects of social deprivation on adolescent development and mental health. Now, the first thing to say is that we don't know very much. And that's probably because in order to study the effects of social deprivation, you would need to deprive adolescents of any kind of social interaction. And obviously, in humans, that's not ethical. So most of the studies that have taught us anything about this are animal studies, particularly with mice and rats, where the animal is isolated from its peers for certain amounts of time. And what those studies have shown, and there are many of them, is that social isolation in adolescents has a unique effect on brain development, behavior, and mental health outcomes. What I mean by that is it it has different effects and arguably more damaging effects on the brain and behavior and mental health compared with social isolation either before adolescence or in adulthood. So those animal studies have suggested that adolescence is a sensitive period for social interaction and depriving animals of social interaction during their adolescence has profound effects. Now, the first thing to say here is that those animal studies have mostly used complete isolation paradigms and the lockdowns and social distancing don't usually involve complete social isolation. Adolescent humans (laughs) around the world now are able to connect with other people either in their households, so their families, or through social media with their friends. So it's not complete social isolation. And in fact, in our paper that we wrote, Amy Auburn is a co-author and she is an expert on social media and adolescent mental health. And in our paper, we 
we looked at the evidence of whether maybe social media and being able to connect socially via your phone and via social media would, to some extent, mitigate the harmful, potentially harmful effects of social deprivation and social distancing on adolescent mental health. So on the one hand, it's a real concern that adolescents are being deprived to some extent of face-to-face interaction with their peers at a stage in life where we know that peer interaction is so crucial for development. On the other hand, to be positive about it, this is a stage in history where we are fortunate in the fact that we're able to connect socially online with other people. So it's not complete social isolation. So maybe parents will be a little more tolerant of having their teenagers on social media and checking Instagram all the time? I know a lot of parents who have actively encouraged their children to connect with their friends over social media and over even over gaming. Parents who prior to this pandemic, you know, were very concerned about trying to limit screen time, but actually screen time and social media have provided a sort of lifeline, a social lifeline for young people, for some young people. But of course, it's not really understood well, but I would argue that screen interaction cannot ever completely replace face-to-face interaction. That is so crucial. And so one of the priorities, I think, in terms of government priorities should be enabling and facilitating young people and children, not just adolescents, but children, young people and young adults to be able to interact with each other and to experience the social interaction and social learning that's so crucial for development. So uh, Sarah Jane, I I ask this question of all of my interviewees. I know it's a difficult one, but uh, I'm very interested to hear what your take on it is. How will the work that you're doing have a measurable impact in the lives of children? And how do you feel this can be assessed? For the last 18 years, we have worked on the development of the social brain and social behavior. And in a way, it's very basic science trying to understand how behavior and and brain develops in typically developing adolescents, that is not going to have a direct influence, translational impact on the way we, for example, teach adolescents or the way we interact with adolescents in society or clinically or anything like that. But what I think it does do, and not just my research, but everyone's research in this area, which by the way, has massively expanded over the last decade or so. And really there is so such a rich database out there of how adolescents develop. And what that research can do is to provide us with a better understanding of adolescent typical behavior, by which I mean things like, you know, why do adolescents tend to take risks? Not all adolescents take risks, but some do. And why is that? Is it, you know, 20 years ago, I think the idea was, oh, they're just misbehaving and it's their hormones or it's their rebellion. But actually, we now have a much deeper understanding of the neural, biological and social reasons why adolescents, some adolescents might show a heightened propensity to take risks. And we we see their behavior in a more rational light. It sheds a more rational light on behavior that otherwise could be seen as really quite irrational. So I think this kind of research helps teachers and parents and even adolescents themselves to understand their own behavior. And it it enables teachers and parents to support young people and their development. Uh, Young people might look like adults, but they don't, their brains are not yet adult and they still need, just like children, they still, still need a lot of support and care and help and empathy. Well, I think that's a fantastic place to end. Sarah Jane, thank you so much. I very much appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to talk with us and the very best of luck uh, with your future research. Thank you very much. And also a big thank you to our podcast audience for joining us. If you'd like to send us your feedback or any suggestions, please email custompodcast at aaas.org. For more podcasts in this series, please visit the blog on learning and development website by going to bold.expert. Thank you again to Dr. Sarah Jane Blakemore and also to the Jacobs Foundation for making this series possible. I'm Sean Sanders. Thank you for listening. Thank you.